Welcome back this is part 1 of what if Issei was a half dragon hybrid. I won't drag this intro out longer so let's begin. Chapter 1. Issei Hiyodo, a second year student at the Kuo Academy, was sleeping in his bed. Unfortunately for him, his dreams were as far from peaceful as they get. The teenager was thrashing around, mumbling incoherent things. Sometimes, he would shout or groan in pain and grip the bedsheets painfully. Earlier he had problems drifting into the land of Morpheus, he was all distracted and giddy, thinking about the coming days. His time in school consisted of suffering through lessons, distracting himself with his usual peaking sessions and running away with his friends from the angry and violent victims of said activity. When he returned home, his thoughts were still occupied by the fact that in two days his siblings were supposed to start coming to his home and bring with them noise, supernatural elements and undeniably trouble. Of course, Issei was happy to see them again, but at the same time, he wasn't so sure about re-entering that more extraordinary side of the world just yet. After quite long and tiring nagging from a dragon inside his head, he tried to forget worrying about the future all night and finally tried to catch some sleep. But when you're thinking about something all day, there's a high chance of it coming back to you in your dreams. It ended up being a nightmare. A nightmare filled with flashbacks of what happened over three years ago. Things that made him back out of everything related to supernatural, dragons and all of that for a time being. In his slumber, Issei was again in the fog of war, with familiar voices screaming around him. Unbelievable pain flooded his mind while his body stuck in an incomplete transformation. The feeling of pain ended. But now Issei was hovering over the body in his younger self. He took a look around the scene. As dream went on, everything except for him blurred and the voices became muffled. Issei stood there, reliving what was one of the scary days of his life. DXD, wake up, wake up, if you don't wake up I'm going to K-kiss you. Out of the bedsheets, a hand lazily crawled and slammed alarm. After getting rid of the annoying sound it quickly hid again and its owner stirred under the covers trying to go back to sleep. Get up, Issei, as much as I try to stop myself from saying, I told you so. It won't change the fact that you have to move out of bed and make yourself look at least half decent. His sleep was again interrupted by an ancient voice in his head. Another stir, this time accompanied by a pitiful groan. You've just said it, you stupid ass dragon. And I won't hear anything about sleeping from you, it's what you're doing for most of the time and every time when you're needed, so leave me be Drake. Came the muffled voice under the pillow. The voice inside his head wasn't a sign of mental illness but the spirit of Y. Diedrake Gok, Red Dragon Emperor, one of two heavenly dragons. I can let you be, but then I'll go talk to your mother and as, stupid ass dragon, I might accidentally slip and say that you're still laying around when you're supposed to prepare for school. And you wouldn't want that, would you? Diedrake said with smugness, moment of silence, after which came rustling, when visibly scared person all but shoot on legs and hastily started preparing himself. He was average height teenager with spiky brown hair, which was right now in total chaos. His light brown eyes showed fear at the threat. You're a monster, a monster you hear me, but at least you're not using my head for your bickerings with Albion, or I'd just hit my head until everything went black. Good thing he's mostly with Valley lately. The teenager said after grabbing a set of clothes and heading towards the bathroom to shake off remnants of the nightmare. If you hadn't stayed up for most of the night being nervous about everybody coming home, then you wouldn't be in this predicament. A true warrior should dominate his weaknesses, and I won't allow my stop right there. First of all, I haven't seen them for over a year. Hell, with Cat it has been almost three and he's showing up tomorrow. So it's perfectly normal to feel nervous. Second, I'm about to take a shower, so go back to sleep or something. Issei interrupted Diedrake's babble about being a warrior, strength and blah 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 yada yada. All he got was a murmur, then he finally got his peace and quiet. First things first, gotta do something to make me not look like shit. DXD, you look like shit, a bald guy commented, making himself look decent didn't work out. Even after setting hair in his usual hairstyle he still had bloodshot eyes, not counting he was all sweaty and panting for the badly needed air. He only had a few minutes left to wear his uniform as fast as humanly possible, drop his parents short, hi, grab his bento and ride on his bike at breakneck speed just to not be late. 
Right now he was standing before the entrance to Kuo Academy, a few minutes before lessons start. Look who's talking. You two look like you've been run over by a bus, or at least an angry mob. Issei shot back at his friend's jab. Actually it was an angry kendo club, not a mob. But close enough. Another guy rebutted. These were Matsuda and Motohama, Issei's friends, who, with him, were known to other students as the perverted trio. Both of them were in the standard Kuo uniforms and looked like they fought with a gorilla only to lose miserably. The trio mostly concerned themselves with watching porn, creeping everyone out with their loud perverted talks and peeping at girls in various situations. And while the last always ended in them getting beat up or trampled, it was never this close to death. Those two looked more like plums than humans, dot can they even be humans to survive an onslaught like this? What did you idiots try to do that enraged them that much? Grope them, steal their panties. Through Issei's head ran a few more intense scenarios. It couldn't be rape, these two would never do that. Right, actually, after short thought, with a little push, they would do just that. They desperately needed girlfriends for their own good. What's worse, he wasn't much better, at least in the girlfriend department. Issei was sure he would never try to rape someone. The three of them enrolled into this school because it recently turned co-ed, so boys were in the drastic minority and they dreamed to use it to date multiple girls at once and create their own harems. And it ended in a dream state because they were now second years and none of them hadn't even dated once. Both beaten perverts shook their heads energetically, quickly followed with whines of pain. Nothing like that, we were just peeping on them as usual and when we tried to run some handsome asshole appeared out of nowhere. He tripped us and then fucking bowed to the girls with a smirk saying that were, perverted presents for pretty ladies to punish. Traitor of his own gender. Matsuda growled through his teeth. Yeah, because of him we didn't have a chance to wear them out. Come to think of it, it's also your fault. If you were with us, part of the beating would be focused on you or we could just throw you at them as a distraction and run. Motohama closed onto his friend to make him feel some of their pain. Issei deadpanned at both of them and was just about to point out how, great, of friends they were when a flash of red hair caught his attention. Rias Gramori, one of Kuo's two great ladies, was staring directly at him from the school building. Just thinking of her figure, or more importantly, her boobs sent. Issei's brain into the gutter with a perverted grin plastered on his face. You remember that she's a devil. Her having interest in you is not good news, especially considering your decision about the supernatural. I know Diedrake, but boobs. Hearing Diedrake inside his head reminded him about lessons, so he ran into the school building, his friends right behind him. DXD, Akino, mark him as a potential candidate and tell Kaneko to follow him discreetly after school for some time. You think that he's the answer to your marriage problem. He looks kinda cute, despite his perversion. I don't know, but I can sense something inside him and we're almost out of time. DXD, told you not to worry about anything. I knew I would make it in time. Issei was sitting in his place in the classroom and talking telepathically to the dragon spirit. Or at least tried to, as the only response that he got from him was a low grunt. Before the team could think about a way to make Diedrake talk, his teacher entered. Alright, listen up. Before we start today's lessons I want to introduce to you a new transfer student who will be attending our class. Come and greet your new classmates. Teacher motioned towards open doors. From behind them shot black and white blur, which abruptly stopped right in the middle of the classroom. The newcomer was a tall boy in Kuo Academy uniform. He had jet black hair, white bangs, orange eyes and black red headphones hanging from his neck. With a Cheshire Cat grin, he turned towards staring crowd. Hello everyone, my name is Hyodo Septimus, but everybody calls me Sep. Please take care of me. The new student said with a carefree manner and ended with a bow. Raising his head he spotted Issei and happily waved to him. Hey brother, how's it going? Surprise. Two voices said the inside shocked boy's head. For a moment there was absolute silence. Everyone moved their eyes between the Hyodos, trying to scale the situation. And then like a pierced balloon everything exploded. Oh, he's so cute. I don't believe he's related to the beast. I wonder if he's single. He's probably another pervert. A feminine side of the class all shouted at once. Why isn't he some cute girl? What's with those white hair? Who does he think he is? 
Die handsome. The masculine side of the class shouted in anger. Scratch. With a loud noise of moving chairs too beaten up guys suddenly stood up. You're the asshole that tripped us. They roared in perfect unison. Septimus just stood there smirking all this time. After the duo's outburst, he raised his hands to catch everyone's attention again. Calm down, I'll gladly answer your questions, but one at a time. So, who's first? A girl with brown braids and pink framed glasses, Ika Kuryu, stood up. I have a few questions. How are you Issei's brother when you look completely different? And what are those idiots talking about? She said, pointing at the still standing Motohama and Matsuda, after which both of them sat down again. Well, we're not related. We're adopted in the same family after our biological parents died when we were little. Actually, there's six of us, one more brother and three sisters, and some of them will enroll here soon too. Everyone looked at Issei. No one except his two friends even suspected that he had siblings, or was adopted. And about Baldi and his friend with glasses, it's short story. I saw them spying on the girls' changing room, then running away from what I assumed to be the wrath of those girls, so I, helped them to slow down a little. He finished with a chuckle. The female part of the class started gossiping, which only intensified after Kates and Murayama confirmed the second part with a nod. Kuryu asked the next questions with a dead serious face. Only two more questions. Are you perverted like your brother and do you have a girlfriend? Taken aback by the blunt interrogation Septimus looked at her in silence for few seconds and then answered with an uncertain tone. I'm not sure what you mean. If you ask whether I'm going to sneak into lockers, discuss porn out loud or something like that, then of course not but for sure I'm neither gay or some hermit. And at this moment no, I'm single. At this moment Issei came out of shock. Deidre, what the fuck? You knew Sep was coming back today and you stayed silent. And that he's in my classroom. And why this idiot doesn't even try to hide his presence at all. Even with my abilities sealed I can sense him, the devils here must know for sure that he's not human. The mad teenager yelled inside his head. While other students were asking their questions, the ancient spirit tried his best to calm the boy down. Settle down hatchling before you make yourself a fool. The reason why I haven't said anything to you is that Cat asked for it to surprise you. And about him showing off his nature, I have no idea. You'll have to ask him yourself. Alright, that's enough for now. Please, take a seat behind your brother and we will start the lesson. The teacher said, at which Septimus nodded. When he sat at his new place, Issei without turning said telepathically. We need to talk. That we shall do. Can't wait till break. Issei sighed, knowing that his brother was enjoying the turn of events and attention he got. DXD. I'm hurt, brother. We don't see each other for almost three years and you won't even say, hey, it's good to see you again. They were laying under a tree, shoulder to shoulder, staring at the blue sky. Lunch break started and they finally had a chance to talk freely. Don't joke around. This is serious. I know you good enough to understand all this. Surprise show up. But what got into your head to just walk in here while all but screaming? Yo, I'm a fucking supernatural. Septimus looked at him dumbfounded. You still hold that charade with the seal. I could smell a dragon on you the moment I passed the gate. So I thought you stopped hiding and I can just walk as myself here. Now it was Issei turn to stare blankly. What are you talking about? It could be that your seal is breaking because up close I could mistake you for a sacred gear user. That would explain the sudden interest of the devils in him. Probably. Well, we can't help it now. The black and white haired boy shrugged. If I suddenly started masking my presence that would only make me more suspicious. We just have to go with the flow. Ah, before I forget, go home without me. I still have to take care of my stuff. I got here a little earlier than expected and I'm supposed to pick them up after school later. No problem. And Sep, it's good that you're back, bro. DXD. Issei was walking back home when he spotted a beautiful girl his age standing on the path. She was in a school uniform with a dark red jacket, had navy blue hair and what Issei noticed foremost, dot was that her boobs were enormous. When he approached her, she smiled at him shyly and said something that almost gave him a heart attack. Please go out with me. Issei's brain refused to work. This beautiful girl asked him to go out with her. Girl. Date. Him. It was like a dream come true. 
Only after the next few seconds did Issei realize that he was staring at her boobs and didn't answer. Great, you've most likely just screwed up your first real chance to get a girlfriend, great fucking job Issei. He started yelling at himself in his thoughts. Trying to save the situation he shook his head and stuttered. WW what? He mentally facepalmed. Worst. Reaction. Ever. R. You Hyodo's Issei-san. Yes. I've always seen you pass by here and, well, um. Now it was her turn to start stuttering. Ah. It's just too cute. His eyes again wandered onto her heavenly mounds. No. Bad Issei. After a moment the girl calmed herself. Will you be my boyfriend? Unbeknownst to any of them, a certain white-haired girl eating sweets was watching them. DXD. On his way home Issei felt like his feet got wings and everything became, like, more colorful. After he, with great enthusiasm, accepted her offer, the girl introduced herself as Kara. They talked for some time, after which Kala suggested, they go on a date this weekend. Can't wait to rub it in Matsuda and Motohama's faces. School romance. Adultery fortification, which is almost the same as adultery. Naked women, Moahaha, soon, Kara-chan, soon you will be mine, and then my dream will come true and I'll become a harem king. He shouted to the sky, not caring about the weird stares that he attracted from adults, teenagers, children, and animals. Mommy, what is that guy talking about? Mommy, for the love of great red, boy, stop embarrassing yourself. And are you sure she's not some assassin sent to eliminate you? Groaned Deidre, now awake, still not believing what happened when he was napping. You're sounding paranoid Deidre, do you seriously think so low of me that you assume someone would ask me out, only so that she could kill me? And I haven't sensed on her anything but human so you can calm down. But your senses are dulled by your seal, so you can't be certain. You should let Cat check her. No way. He will scare her with his behavior and there will go my chance for a date. The dragon just sighed and said nothing. When Issei reached his home, his mother and father noticed his euphoric expression. Oh, I never thought you'd be so happy to finally meet your brother again. His father commented with a teasing voice. Seriously, did everyone except me knew that Septimus is coming back today? And no, your son is so happy because he finally got a girlfriend. He stated proudly. Crash, what, came behind him loud followed with even louder, fuck. He turned to see Septimus standing over box he just dropped, checking if everything was still in one piece. Language, young man, sorry, Okaa-san, but more importantly, how the hell did Issei get a girlfriend? And who is she? A voice came from Septimus' chest. Albion, what you're doing here? You've been awfully quiet lately. Deidre's voice sounded from Issei's chest. He tagged along while I was on my way here. Septimus shrugged, but we are sidetracking. What's this story about Issei getting a girlfriend out of the blue? Her name is Kara Chan and she confessed to me on the overpass after school. We have a date this weekend. She confessed to you. What's her motive? No one knows that we have a shitload of money. So what? She wants your organs or is just a psycho that wants to kill you? Septimus barely finished his sentence when he received a sharp smack on his head and a death glare from Mrs. Hyodo. Sorry. He apologized sheepishly and adjusted he headphones on his neck. Not you too. Does no one believes that girl would be interested in me without any ulterior motives? Issei asked with a pained voice. If I say, yes, will you be mad at me? His brother retorted teasingly. Issei just helplessly hung his head down but before he could say anything their mother embraced him in a comforting hug. Of course we believe you, Septimus is just making fun of you. Which he will stop right now, or else he will regret it. A cold chill passed through the raven-haired boy's spine. Yeah, it's just an innocent joke. But I can always check with Senjutsu if she's not Yandere or anything. Crazy. At this Issei's head shot up and he freed himself out of the hug. No thanks. I'd prefer if you'd leave her alone, at least until my date with her. I don't want you to scare her off before I had any chance. His brother just laughed and nodded. As you wish, I can leave you two lovebirds alone for this week. And you don't have to worry about me doing something mischievous on your date, I will be out of town. As always at weekends, I have to do my job. But after that, you have to introduce her, no excuses. 
Unexpectedly hearing quiet sobbing three heads turned to its source, to see Mr. Hyodo shedding tears of happiness. My boy will finally become a man. I'm so proud of you son. Oi, dad, it's just a date. Don't jump to any weird conclusions so fast. Issei screamed with panic visible on his face. In the background, he heard the rest of the family laughing their asses off at the situation. DXD. Issei was standing at their meeting spot, checking the time again. He was dressed in his best pants and a new shirt, bought especially for this occasion, it was his mother's advice. Until now everything was going great. Septimus kept his promise and stayed away from them, at least when he was with Kara, he made Issei his main source of fun at school. That in sleeping during lessons, but somehow still managing to pay attention to the topic. Motohama and Matsuda literally cried out of jealousy when Issei introduced his girlfriend to them and were ready to attack him for breaking their pact. The devils at school just watched him, but a little jumpy because of his brother's sudden arrival. He even got one of their flyers a few minutes ago, which he stuffed in his pocket, so it looked like they had no idea what he is. And the best was that both dragons promised to stay out of his head and not interrupt them. All right Issei, show her your best side and that you can be a perfect gentleman. So no perverted thoughts, no lecherous face or anything perverted. And stop talking to yourself in the third person. The nervous teen mumbled to himself. Sorry for being late, I hope you didn't have to wait too long. Kara's voice pulled him out of his thought. She was in a maroon v-neck shirt which plunged very low exposing much of her breasts and a matching short skirt that drew hormonal teenagers' eyes. Don't worry, I also just got here. Issei smiled innocently, trying to kill any unnecessary thoughts about his date's choice of clothes. DXD. It was late afternoon and they walked through the empty park holding hands. For Issei, the date was perfect. Holding hands, visiting stores, lunch in a restaurant and now only two of them during sunset. Almost perfect, the only thing it lacks is a goodbye kiss. He corrected himself. Eyes Kuhn, can you do something for me? Is this it? Issei's mind quickly was clouded with his fantasy, he closed his eyes imagining her lips meeting his and him. Sure, what is it? His dreams were abruptly ended because of searing pain in his chest. Kara's face was right in front of his as if she's about to kiss him and in her hand was the dagger. The dagger was embedded in him all the way to the hilt. Will you die for me? She simply asked, taking a step back and unfolding her wings with black feathers. The feathers flew dramatically all around them. K. Kara Chan. Issei fell on his knees, barely forcing even this one word out of his throat, feeling life slipping away fast with every second. Strangely, the girl's face looked older and her body grew larger and more mature. Even in this situation, Issei's first thought was about her breasts that were about to spill out of the now too small undershirt. Oh, don't you know what's happening? My name isn't Kara, but Kala Warner, a fallen angel. We know who and what you are. Unfortunately for you, our boss doesn't like that you're here and wants you dead. She gloated with a sadistic tone, looking down on his now dying form. This little stunt was just to get me a clear shot, even if it was fun toying with you. But also it ends here. Goodbye. Her blue hair and cold eyes were the last sights before the darkness of death consumed him whole. DXD. Valley Lucifer, the great grandson of the original Lucifer and current possessor of Divine Dividing, was flying over some forest when suddenly his sacred gear vanished only to reappear after a second. Albion, the dragon sealed inside of it, roared painfully frightening every living thing in earshot. His roar was full of sorrow, but also promised wrath and dreadful revenge for whoever was responsible for making his spirit suffer. DXD. On the other side of the globe, a girl dreamed about Red Dragon. In her dream, the dragon was roaring, throwing himself across burning fields and clawing, as if trying to get out of some kind of prison. The girl could feel that dragon was hurting as if he'd just lost someone dear to him. Unexpectedly, the red reptile stopped and focused his gaze on her. Next thing she knew, she was awake, clutching her left hand with pain and the burned sight of emerald eyes filled with grief in her mind. DXD, Septimus changed into his normal clothes and was just about to go tell his boss that he's heading out on a train when his chest felt like someone poured liquid metal on it. Quickly checking the source of pain he found out that there was nothing wrong, which left only one answer. Issei. Without much thinking, 
he sent a short message saying only, emergency, and teleported with his black and white magic circle to the sky above Kuo. Closing eyes, he focused on the bond with his brother, trying to locate him. Before gravity claimed him, he pinpointed Issei's and again teleported. Materializing at the outskirts of the park, he was met with the sight of his brother dying and a blue-haired fallen standing in front of him. Confirming his fears Septimus' eyes literally become orange lights. Black shadows danced around him and clawed at the fallen angel. He feels his blood turning ice cold and two ebony swords appearing in his hands. At the same time, a few things happened. Without a sound, he shot towards Black Winged Bitch with inhuman speed. Warner noticed the intense bloodlust moving at her and saw two orange orbs glowing through some white hair. And suddenly a light spear that came from the trees flew at the attacking Septimus. Deflecting the unexpected projectile, he missed his chance for a quick kill and skidded a few meters away. Finally stopping, he turned with his weapons pointed to where the spear came from, only to see a girl coming fast at him with an expressionless face, dead blank eyes and another light spear in her hand. What makes matters worse is that Septimus recognized both the face and the spear. Ray, just for a split second, he hesitated. Then, the next moment his stomach was pierced and the shadows around him disappeared as he was face to face with his opponent. He stared into her eyes, but haven't found there any recognition, or any other emotion. Something more a machine than a sentient being. Shaking himself out of the shock he slashed both swords at her, but Fallen Angel swiftly jumped back out of his range. With blood pouring out of his stomach he discarded both his swords and summoned dark balls of fire, throwing them at the enemy. Seeing that the situation is getting out of hand and their main objective has been completed Warner made a quick decision. Rainer, we're retreating, she shouted and hastily flew away. Without any sign of confirmation, Rainer dodged the fireballs coming at her, then did same as her colleague and took off into the sky. Come back here, Septimus roared dispersing fire in his hands, but when he tried to follow them his legs refused to obey him and he fell on all fours. The gaping hole in his stomach reminded him of someone laying a few meters away from him. Issei, no, 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 shit, fuck, 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 he yelled while crawling towards the motionless figure of his brother. Don't you dare to die on me, you perverted bastard. When Septimus reached the body, he immediately extracted the dagger, stuffing it behind his belt and started repairing the wound with magic. But as Issei laid without life or showing any signs of coming, Septimus barely noticed his strength leaving him too. Don't leave me, you idiot. Live, he said with his eyes becoming wet. Unexpectedly, a red light started coming out of Issei's pocket, then from the crimson magic circle appeared before the brunette. And out of it came beauty in school uniform with striking blue eyes and the most intense red hair he had ever seen. A devil, what happened here? She looked around seeing blood trail, black feathers, and burnt marks. Save him, please. Not having time to explain Septimus begged, gesturing towards the body between them. The scarlet-haired girl knelt before the dead boy. After noticing it was the same one she was thinking about adding to her peerage she took one of her pawns but when she tried to use it on him she was stopped by the boy with orange eyes. One won't be enough, you need to use all. Hurry up, he stated with frighteningly crazed eyes. The surprised devil wasn't sure about that, but conviction in his tone made her follow his advice. She almost forgot how to breathe for a moment, just how powerful is he. Some of the eight pawns mutated. Only those with a very strong power could mutate an evil piece. Seeing it, Septimus finally relaxed and dropped on the ground like a puppet that had its strings cut. Turning over on the back he finally let loose of all his emotions. Ha 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 ha, he laughed maniacally and cried like a newborn child at the same time. I did it, coming close to him, the devil pointed at the wound in his stomach. You're dying too and it's too late for me to save you with normal methods. Are you willing to join me? Still laughing and crying, the teen nodded. Summoning again her chessboard, she took out her unused bishop and placed it on his chest. When nothing happened and she was about to try her rook but Septimus grabbed her hand with the evil piece. When she looked at him, she saw him staring with extreme determination, but not at her. He was focused on her hand and the bishop piece. Oh no, you fucker. I don't care if you're not enough. If I have to, I'll mutate you myself. Black and white aura swirled around him. 
Septimus concentrated on the area around his hand. Rias Grimori was taken aback by the power coursing inside her bishop piece. When Septimus finally withdrew his aura, the bishop piece was as black as the abyss with rivers of white and red dots all over it. Then the abnormal bishop started glowing, after which it levitated and was absorbed into the boy's chest, who then lost his consciousness. Era, Rias Grimori muttered, awestruck at the event. Chapter 2, Wake up, wake up my love, or else I'll kill you. Wake, Issei slammed his alarm as always in the morning, but this time something was different. When a stray sunbeam found its way under his blanket, it stung him. Uh, I feel like I've been through this whole killing business recently. The teen mumbled and turned to catch a few more minutes of sleep. Issei's sleepy mind registered another weird thing since when did his bed get something warm and soft, like one of those stuffed toys. Running his hand over, it, suddenly he heard soft moan right next to his ear. Losing all signs of sleepiness he bolts up throwing blanket off and before him emerged something that stopped any higher functions of his brain. In his bed laid Rias Gramori, the most beautiful girl in his school, fully naked, with his hand on her bottom and the blissful expression on her sleeping face. After second of silently staring at her bare body, Issei did what any sane person would do. W-H-A-A-A-A-A-T, he screamed out of shock. The girl before him sleepily sit up and at the same time, he could hear a loud thud behind the wall. After few second and more ruckus, his door shot open and in them stood Septimus. With ruined clothes, although his red and black headphones remained strangely intact, blood all over him, white magic circles in his hands and ready to attack at any moment. When he laid his eyes on Issei and Rias, both circles disappeared and he watched the scene before him wide-eyed. Simultaneously Issei had his eyes glued to Rias' breasts while she was stretching, a small trail of blood trailing from his nose. After few second impasse, it was Septimus who broke it. He ran back to his room, only to return the moment later. Okay, why there is naked, sexy devil lady in Issei's bed, who was cleaned and changed. And why there is no sexy devil lady in my bed, where I woke up in bloody rags. And don't try lying to me, I've just checked. He asked, his tone dissatisfied and hurt, it was faked of course. Finally regaining his ability to think, Issei quickly removed his hand from Rias' ass and got up, while Rias not bothering with modesty slowly started to dress. Your life was perfectly secured after reincarnation, while Issei here had problems with something interfering with new demonic energy inside him, so I had to share some of mine with him through skinship. Having her underwear on she reached out to Issei. Issei, could you pass me my skirt? Issei stood there, his eyes following where the girl in his bed was pointing. With shaking hand he gave her cloth and looked between two guests in his room. Can someone tell me, what the hell is going on? Septimus leaned on the door frame and answered him, with his trademark smirk. Hell is actually pretty much your answer. Long story short, you, or more accurately we, died and this lady here resurrected us. So, you're a devil now, at least partly. Hope you enjoy it. Then he remembered something. Oh, I haven't introduced myself yet. Septimus Hiodo, a pleasure to meet you. He said with an informal bow. Now fully dressed girl introduced herself. Rias Grimori, also pleased to meet you. But we shouldn't sidetrack, it seems like whatever is going on with your brother it still refuses to accept the evil pieces in him. Issei listened to them overwhelmed, in few seconds hearing that he died, was reincarnated as devil and now was dying again. However, Septimus just waved his hand dismissively as if everything was alright. That would be his seal. Nothing this little cat here can't fix. Ready, brother. Not waiting for his reaction Septimus summoned another white circle on his palm, which transformed into a shining thin blade sticking out of his hand. Without any hesitation, he drove the blade through other teens. Chest, right where his heart was. Seeing this Rias was about to scream out of horror but stopped herself when saw Issei's reaction. The sudden pain finally brought him fully awake but instead of sharp one like the one he felt the day before, this was more like wasp sting. Wincing slightly he looked at Septimus with accusation. Really, couldn't you use something a little more gentle? Of course I could, but it wouldn't look so cool. Now brace yourself, this will hurt. And with that, he turned his hand and instantly pulled. There was no blood, the shining blade was ethereal. 
When it came out Issei started shining in both green and blue, waves of power pouring uncontrollably out of him. When the familiar energy started coursing through his veins, Issei screamed and almost fell backward, his brother catching him. Rias was looking astonished at the events before her. Barely few hours and those two managed to surprise her more times than she could count. When the energy hit her she couldn't describe its amount but was sure it was of draconic origin. Those two can be the answer to my forced engagement with Riser. After Septimus helped his brother to stand up, his eyes lost its humor. They were clearly saying, we need to talk. I'm sorry, Rias Senpei. I'm sure you have many questions but it's a long story so it would be better if we tell it once when everyone involved is together. Explained Issei, that is probably the best option. Meet me at the old school building before lessons start, I'll introduce you two to the rest of my peerage and we'll answer each other's questions. She answered and then teleported with a red circle. Right after the devil left the room, Issei started. All right, so, but before he could say anything more something interrupted him. Issei, Septimus, are you two all right? Who did this? Suddenly two dragons showed up in their minds, roaring with concern and rage. Both Hyodos grasped their heads with pain at unexpected arrival of two loud spirits. Yes, we are, you overgrown lizards. Or at least we were before you butted in screaming like drunkards in a bar. So tone down, yelled back angry Septimus. So, as I was trying to say, do you have any idea how this fallen angel managed to fool my senses? Even sealed, I should have recognized what she was. Unfortunately I know, they have Rainair working for them. But I'll wager you my tale that she's mind controlled. She can be a bitch, but she would never kill her friends. If Rainair was behind that illusion, then no wonder Issei couldn't see through the blue one. But it still doesn't explain how you died cat, said Albion with curiosity. Septimus looked down embarrassed, a useless gesture considering four of them were linked with their minds. Quote dot dot dot, I was distracted, he muttered, let's leave this for now. What's more important, we have to find out who those fallen angels are and what to do with them. Issei interrupted, feeling that both dragons were about to chew his brother out for losing focus during the fight. Oh, with that I can help, the black-haired Hyodo said, raising his head and searching through clothes. After a few seconds, he took out the familiar dagger. This is the dagger that killed you and it's clearly dragon slaying magic. Nothing even close to Ascalon, but still formidable, so whoever got this for them have to be well connected. Also, they're fallen angels, so we know who we have to contact in first place. Yeah, call him right now, even if he doesn't know anything. We should still inform him that some of his men that have gone astray because I'm sure he would never order to kill us. Also, right before I died, Kara Chan. No, Kala Warner said something about boss, so some of the higher ups are probably involved. Issei, shared his assumption with the rest. That's most likely true, but how high do you think it reaches? Could someone from Kadri be entangled in this too? We can't exclude that option. I'll tell Valley to ask around about anything that could help with that matter. Way ahead of you, Issei. And Albion, when you're at it, Tell that battle freak that we're okay and now that I'm back he'd better show up soon. It's been too long since we've seen each other face to face. After both dragons left their minds Septimus conjured a human-sized white circle on the floor. Out of it came a projection of a blonde mature woman. She had a blue secretary uniform consisting of a short skirt and a jacket that tightly hugged her rich curves. Her office image was completed with a pair of blue glasses. Gregory headquarters, how can I help you? She asked formally, but when she saw both teenagers her voice quickly relaxed. Oh, Eyes and Sep, how are you, boys? I wasn't expecting you to contact us, especially Eyes. Good morning Claire, been better. Could you connect us to Azazel? It's extremely important, Issei said while both of them bowed their head, politely greeting the woman. Sorry, but I can't help you. The Governor General and the rest of Kadri is currently out of reach. They went on a meeting with the Norse Pantheon but should be back in two days. Do you want me to pass a message to him? Claire asked in a business tone. Shit, two days with Asgardians means two days of drinking till you end under the table, nothing will reach him. Thanks for help Claire, just ask him to contact us when he's sober. Have a good day, 
commented an irritated Septimus. You too, boys. And tell your mother I said, hello, it's been a long time since you visited us. Except you, Septimus. With that, she cut the connection. So we can't count on Azazel for at least three days and without consulting him we can't make a move against them. So that makes meeting Rias and her group main problem for now. It will be interesting to see their reaction. Issei chuckled. You were fairly interested in Grimori's boobs for what I've seen. Although you surprised me when you had your hand on her ass instead of them. Anyway, you have one more problem that you've forgotten. Septimus left the room laughing. Oi, that was an accident, even if very fortunate. And what you're talking about? Issei yelled after his brother. Your clothes. Welcome back in Supernatural, bro. Came to him. As Issei looked down it dawned on him that he was standing this whole time only in his pants. DXD. Brothers were now standing outside the old school building. Fortunately, their parents left on Saturday, having some important business, so explaining all this mess to them was conveniently delayed. Both were in their uniforms, Septimus with his ever-present headphones. We're doing this as planned, I'm the one who's gonna do the talking. When the time is right I'll give you a sign and boom. Everyone speechless with brain overload. Septimus went over the plan again. You're definitely way too much into Theatrix. Commented Issei with a deadpan expression. Tell me something I don't know. Give him a break. It's boring with my host when she can't communicate with me yet. So let me have some fun watching the reaction of those devils as they'll hear it. You too, Diedrake. Relax hatchling. Just let the old dragons have some amusement. Quote dot dot dot. I'm not gonna even comment it. Alright, we're doing it your way, Sep. Issei lost all hope for winning this argument and decided to just go with the flow. Great, let's get this show on the road. The hyped up Septimus clapped his hands. DXD. The inside of the occult research club was decorated Victorian style. Its members sitting on couches and sipping tea. Way to kill the mood, interjected Diedrake. Shut up. I like it, especially the table retorted Septimus. Noticing their appearance a blonde fellow went over to them and shook their hands with a smile that made Issei cringe his teeth. Hello, I'm Kiba Yuda, member of the Occult Research Club. You must be Hyodo Issei and Septimus. Nice to meet you, the same to you, and for future reference, I prefer Sep, my full name is way too a mouthful. Answered the dark-haired boy with a smile of his own. I sense some gay vibes between you two. Issei sneered to his brother telepathically. Septimus let go his grip like burned. Fuck off. Looking between brothers, Yudo shrugged at their weird behavior. Sorry, but Bucho will be in a minute. In the meantime, I'll introduce you to other members. This is Himahima Akino the Fukubucho and Tuju Kaniko. He stated pointing respectively at spitting image of a Yamato Natashiko and petite white-haired girl eating sweets. While Issei's eyes stopped on Akino's breasts, Septimus walked to greet her. Pleasure to meet you, my name is Hyodo. He started, but when he looked into her eyes, his voice refused his wishes and an ice-cold chill ran down his spine. Ie tilde tilde, he screamed in an unmanly manner and jumped back with a look of pure terror, accidentally tripping over couch and landing on his butt. The club members gave him a weird look, Issei looked away from Akino's boobs for a moment while both dragons inside the Hyudaus's heads erupted laughing. What are you doing? Screaming like a girl. Fuck off, I'm not coming near her. She's a fucking sadist. How can you tell? Besides, you're a sadist too. I can feel it, and not that kind of sadist. I bet info about Big Z's porn stash that under her bed, you can find all sort of BDSM shit. Issei laughed at his brother his mind showing him Akino in revealing dominatrix suit, while Ladder was frantically running his eyes over the room. Anyo. Akino started but was quickly interrupted by Septimus jumping on his feet. I need a shield, fast. Best a human shield, Issei. No, he will let her eat him with that perverted grin on his face. That Yudo guy, hell no, got enough of those, gay vibes. That leaves only one choice. He ranted to himself, with a quick jump. He was behind the small girl holding her between himself and the, scary, female. Thou shall be my shield and protect me from this monster. Both Yudo and Issei watched the situation, not exactly sure what to do. Sep, I think you're overreacting. Issei tried to calm his brother. No, Kaneko stated emotionlessly, 
I'll buy you a big box of sweets every month. Offered the black haired boy. Every day. The small girl answered with her own proposal. Every week. Deal. She answered without hesitation. Akino Senpei. Please stay away. Quote dot dot dot. What just happened? Asked the dumbfounded Akino. Septimus visibly relaxed with his new protector and took a deep breath. Suddenly his eyes shot open and he took a deep whiff of Kaneko's scent. The held girl stiffed and started emitting a cold aura. Pervert. Again the terrified Septimus placed her down and started slowly backing off holding his hands defensively. WW wait, it's not like that. I've just. Thud. Whatever he tried to say was stopped when Rius entered the room with two other females. Era era, what's going on here? She asked wondering what was happening. When no one answered her she coughed and continued. Let me introduce to you. Sona Sitri and Subaki Shinra, we've met. Interrupted Septimus, regaining his composure. Oh, so you've known that I'm a devil just by true name. Sona asked surprised. Yes, isn't it obvious? I've brought Sona here to introduce you to each other and let her hear your story. Explained Rias. As that, all right, there should be no problem since Sona is the sister of Amao and Subaki is her queen. But for the sake of three factions, all that will be stated can't leave this room. Some of these will be Satan level secrets, you can ask about it your siblings later. Said Issei with a serious tone. Everyone looked after each other and nodded their heads slowly, with Rias and Sona crossing eyes and silently agreeing on doing just what Issei suggested. Alright, now that everyone's here, please sit on the couch. Getting their attention Septimus pointed at their seats. To fully understand the story, it has to be told from the very begging and uninterrupted, so please stay your question and enjoy the tale. Then, let's begin. He ended with a loud clap and the room went dark. We don't know what was at the beginning. The few beings that were there are now either dead, faded, or don't care about anything besides themselves and forgot. That or they just don't want to say anything. Septimus' voice rang through the room. Then the darkness got illuminated, showing multicolored flashes. Slowly they started changing, taking more recognizable forms. A golden light that looked like a river of sand and a mist around it that devoured its light. After a minute the previously black room became full of every imaginable color flying around and fighting with each other. In the center, with the red and gray lights shining from his closed hands, stood Septimus, white bangs covering his eyes. We can only assume it was space outside of space where conceptual entities existed before there were any laws binding this and other worlds. The remnant of this state is the Dimension Gap, home of the two most powerful conceptual entities, the Dragon of Dragons and the Ouroboros Dragon. With those words, he opened his hands. Out of the left flew a red light that looked like a western dragon, while a grey light came from his right hand with a form that was ever-changing. Slowly some of those beings morphed, creating this universe and every basic law governing it. Parts of light formed the sphere, much more logical, surrounded by an iridescent maelstrom. Others stayed the same, not concerned with what was happening around them. The third group, the weakest breed, descended to their siblings' creation. They, envious of what was created, wanted something for themselves, so they formed worlds, galaxies, stars and finally, in their own image, life. Lights again separated, part of it was still roaming the colorful chaos, others sank into the sphere, constructing corporal shapes. Through this creation, the most noticeable beings were dragons, shadows of the true dragon and the dragon god, and gods, children, of descended conceptuals. And all of them were obeying the new rules. Time passed, worlds were created and destroyed, gods were born and died, same with conceptuals, as they lost their individuality and dissolved into their domains. Fractions and pantheons were formed, the god from the Bible with his system and angels is the most powerful inside the universe. Sphere changed into the image of cosmos as we know it. Everyone stared in silence at Septimus, who was standing outside of this spectacle, his hands spread, orchestrating magical projection and narrating history. Now, this is when we start to have more dependable information. During the rule of biblical god, one of the angels, Lucifer, rebelled against his creator and alongside him were his three accomplices, Beelzebub, Leviathan, and Asmodeus, who rejected their cores as angels and fell into the furthest place from heaven, into the underworld. There, they absorbed its floating energy and became the antithesis to what they previously were, the devils. It's unclear how they did that, but with the help 
of the first woman, Lilith, they created a whole race of their kind and populated the underworld, creating 72 pillars, the oldest clans governing it. In the middle of those events, another group led by Azazel also turned their back on God's teaching and succumbed to sin. As they didn't relinquish beings angels, but still were cast out of heaven they became another new race, fallen angels. The projection closed up to the universe, leaving the multicolored dimension gap out of it and showed the birth of three factions in their present form. The angels hated devils by nature and denounced their fallen brothers and sister. Devils detested all kinds of angels. The fallen angels wanted the realm for themselves. With all that bad blood, something was bound to happen. No one knows which faction started it, but soon after there was all-out, three-way war between them. All other supernatural races soon picked their sides and also joined, with the exception of the dragons. And so, thousands of years ago, the Great War started. Humans were gifted with sacred gears to help them survive. Ongoing battles left an imprint in their history, as they often took sides and different groups fought for every race. Here the projection abandoned its spherical form, showing different battlefields. Sometimes they were purely supernatural, while other times there were humans' armies clashing against each other with three factions following their actions in the sky. Around a thousand years ago happened something unprecedented. During one of their battles, two dragons, the most powerful of their kind after Great Red and Ophis, interfered. As two powerful beasts fought, they killed soldiers on all sides. Leaders of the factions tried to stop them, but that only enraged both dragons. In face of such a powerful enemy, devils, angels, and fallen angels called a ceasefire. With the joined power of three faction, they managed to kill both of them, with God sealing their souls inside sacred gears. The scenery changed again, around them was battle, but instead of the three factions fighting each other, they stood side by side, facing the red and white dragons that were ripping through their forces. After some time it showed the leaders of the three faction as they entered the battle, changing its tides in their favor. The projection ended with an image of both dragons dying, after which room changed back to normal. That ends the first part, if you have any questions, ask away. Said Septimus in a merry voice, his serious persona vanishing in a second. Why did you stop, you had them eating from your hand and now you're losing that atmosphere. Diedrag couldn't understand the young man's action. Shish, I know what I'm doing. I've just shown them flashy appetizers, now I just have to leave them with even more questions till they're boiling. Only then will I let them eat the main dish. His culinary metaphor stopped the dragon from prying, who decide to just wait for the results. Sona was the first to cool off after the show. You weren't kidding when you said that you'll start from the beginning. I have few questions. How do you know what happened back at the beginning? And where did you get photos of the Great War from? I've seen some of those from the Battle of the Heavenly Dragons and they were identical to what you showed us, it wasn't merely work of your mind. Also, why all this running around the bush with the story? The Sea Tree heiress was suspicious towards the New Devils, they knew too much for someone without access to higher level secrets. Septimus scratched his chin, taken aback by the direct way of question. Wow, right to the point as expected of someone from the Citri clan. So, Sona Senpei, in questioned order. As I said, I don't know, I'm just familiar with some of the few theories about it. Yes, I was shown those photos. By whom? Well, I'll state in the second part of my tale. And why all this? Quite simply, to create an appropriate mood and some theatrix for the grand reveal. He ended with a smirk. Septimus Kuhn, how are you so skilled in magic to manage projection of this level, without any visible flaws and at the same time so detailed? Asked the curious Rius, causing the storyteller to wince. Please, just Sep, it can be without honorifics. My full name is too much of a mouthful to use in normal conversations. You could say that I'm quite skilled in a few branches of magic, with illusion among them. If there are no more questions, let's begin the second part, which will actually answer your questions. Seeing that everyone wanted to hear rest of the story, he again entered his, narrator, Modin with a dramatic wave of his hand, the room changed again, this time showing what looked like a simple village in ancient Japan. Now let's move a bit. Some day before the battle that ended with the demise of heavenly dragons two half-dragons were born, both in Japan, in two simple villages. 
A boy and a girl were raised by their human mothers, as their fathers left without even knowing that each of them was going to have a child. Dragons have other meaning to their race, you either are one or you are not. If a half-breed possesses draconic power then they are considered full dragon the moment when they fully develop. Those children eventually grew up and lived their lives as dragons live, doing whatever they wanted. At some point, they meet each other and found they are very much alike. Not concerned with the outside politics of the supernatural world, they just spent their time together. The story showed an outline of said dragons, their early lives, childhood in human forms, the moment when they reached their maturity and changed into their other selves, white and red respectively, when they meet. As dragons they were exceptional, kind-hearted, calm, but at the same time, as immensely powerful as their fathers, with a peculiar ability. They could hear their respective fathers inside their minds. Said fathers weren't happy with their children's relationship but respected their decision. The older dragons were rivals and them being in those villages in the first place was the result of one their battles. Time flew by and a new millennium approached, they chose to settle down, for they were expecting a child of their own. Coming back to Japan and starting new lives here with the newborn son, that was their dream. For the first few years everything was good, but when the boy was five, the family was found by a rogue group of dragon slayers. Using the surprise and the boy against his parents they managed to kill both of them, but the whole group paid for that with their lives. The only one left living was the little boy. He'd surely die too, if not for voices in his head telling him what to do and calling themselves his grandfathers. The little half-breed was without any living family and for sure not old enough to be left alone, lived for few weeks on streets, surviving thanks to his unique physiology and advice of both spirits. One day, he accidentally stumbled across a child his age in the same situation, a little male Nekomata, feral as a tiger. Actually, when they first met, the little cat tried to bite him. Septimus continued his tale with a sad expression, lighting up at the end and lightly chuckling, remembering this particular moment and Issei's reaction. Issei at the couch had his eyes stuck in the ground, also inside his memories, but far from happy ones. They'd want you to live on and would be proud of a man you've become. After this little incident, both boys, reluctant and warily at first, talked about themselves. Quickly it was clear that they were alike. So when the boys' grandfathers proposed that they stay together, they stuck together like brothers. For next days, they were together hunting, scavenging garbage and day by day they told each other more of their history. The little Yukai could remember only fragments, mostly about his mother and that she died during some attack. One night beside their campfire, the half-dragon, having the kind heart of his parents, declared that from now on he will be the cat's family. The dragon's spirits told them about a symbolic blood pact, that was supposed to be a dragon's equivalent to adoption and would make them true brothers in everything except parents. However, the ritual had a little side effect, as they could hear each other in their minds. The Yukai could also hear both dragons and later on, they found out that they shared with each other some of their abilities. Shortly after, they were found by a certain individual with another boy. Someone wanting peace between the three factions, who seeing them had certain idea how to realize his goal. His projection followed the history, showing both boys in different situations. Near the end, Issei stood up and walked to his brother. Time for the main event. Wait for it. Grinning inside Septimus spread his arm like a showman and started with a dramatic voice. Ladies and gentlemen, let me present to you Hyodo Issei, half-dragon, grandson of both heavenly dragons, and me, Hyodo Septimus. Something just as rare, a male Nekomata, Nekosho. Sign. Shouting in his mind he released his tails and ears. Both tails and ears were in different colors, with the left one were as dark as night and right were as white as snow, reversely with ears. At the same time, Issei unfolded his draconic wings. His scales were brightly white, with the red tattoo-like patterns running where the bones were, each ending with a deadly-looking talon. A silence that fell upon them. A silence wherein one could hear a falling needle, everyone stared at the now-identified Nekomata and dragon-turned-devils. They just stood there the former grinning that his plan worked perfectly and the latter laughing inwardly with his grandfathers at their reaction. Then, waving his tails, Septimus spoke with merry voice. Well, looking at you, it's actually not that great a feat when we have here another Nekomata and a fallen angel hybrid, the daughter of the cadre member nonetheless. 
That's all for now until next time.